Good afternoon, everyone. This is John Shaw, the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at Southern Illinois University. Thanks for joining another installment of our series, Understanding Our New World. And today, we're really delighted to be joined uh, by a friend of ours, Elliot Cohen, who is a one of the leading foreign policy and strategic thinkers in the United States. He's also an expert on William Shakespeare and has written about him in a terrific new book called The Hollow Crown, Shakespeare on How Leaders Rise, Rule, and Fall. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Elliot. He is a native of Boston, went to Harvard as an undergrad and did graduate work there. He taught there. He's also taught at the Army and Navy War Colleges. He was a professor for some 30 years at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies in Washington, D.C. Uh, he was also a dean at SICE, as the school is called. Uh, he served in the State Department, the Defense Department. He's been on the Defense Policy Board. And now he has uh, an important affiliation with the Center for Strategic and International Studies in um, D.C. He's actually had uh, he's, he's worked with them for, for some time. Um, he's written a couple terrific books, Supreme Command, Big Stick, is also a contributing writer for The Atlantic. For faithful attendees in this series, you might say, gosh, don't I recognize Elliot Cohen? We were delighted to have him a couple of years ago. And in the course of our conversation, uh, I'd asked some questions about his, his writings referring to Shakespeare. And he said, oh, by the way, I have a book going. So Elliot and I have kind of kept in touch over the last couple of years. And I've been saying, how's the book coming? And just a few a month or two ago, I was delighted to learn that the book has, in fact, come out. And um, I'm really delighted to to visit with Elliot again and to talk about his book. So, Elliot, good afternoon. John, thank you for that uh, that wonderful introduction. It's uh, great to be back virtually. One of these days, I want to get out and see you in person, but uh, it's nice to be with you virtually. Thank you. Yeah, no, we are definitely going to get you out here. We've talked about that the last time, and we're going to do, we're going to do it for sure. Well, Elliot, let's talk. About, I mean, as I mentioned, you know, you have this great uh, background and as a military historian, a, a, a strategy expert, um, but you also have this fascination with Shakespeare. And how did you first um, become exposed to Shakespeare in, in kind of a compelling way? I mean, was it a high school teacher, a college class? What was the initial intrigue? Well, it, it it was very much a. Uh, I had a wonderful high school teacher. Uh, I went to a terrific uh, school. It was a Hebrew day school, actually, which uh, had both a very intense uh, Hebraica and Judaica education, but an equally intense um, secular education. And I had a, a wonderful English teacher, and we read actually quite a bit of Shakespeare in those days. Um, and uh, that made it come alive. And then, you know, my my wife and I had always enjoyed um, going to see performances of Shakespeare. And in Washington, as you know, there are not one but two Shakespeare theaters. There's the Folger Theater, which is part of the great Folger Library, one of the great Shakespeare libraries in the world. Uh, and then the Shakespeare Theater. And a number of years ago, we went to see a performance of Henry VIII. And that's a play that doesn't get put on um, as much as I think it deserves. For a while, people weren't even entirely sure that it was actually written by Shakespeare. I think most people think it's some sort of collaboration now. And there's, there was a wonderful moment. And if you are if you will bear with me. Absolutely. Um, I, what I'd like to do is just read a few lines because this is what uh, got me onto it. So in uh, the play, as in real life, uh, the uh, chancellor... The, in fact, the prime minister for Henry VIII, although that, that title hadn't been invented yet, Cardinal Wolsey is suddenly deposed. And it's a shocker for everybody. And he gives this wonderful speech, which goes as follows. Farewell, a long farewell to all my greatness. This is the state of man. Today he puts forth the tender leaves of hopes, tomorrow blossoms, and bears his blushing honors thick upon him. The third day comes a frost, a killing frost. And when he thinks good easy man, full surely his greatness is a ripening, nips his root, and then he falls as I do. I have ventured like little wanton boys that swim on bladders this many summers in a sea of glory, but far beyond my depth. My high-blown pride at length broke under me and now has left me weary and old with service to the mercy of a rude stream that must forever hide me. So as I was listening to that, I said to myself, I know that guy. <laughs> I mean, if if you live in Washington, you know people like that who 
have been swimming on a sea of glory uh, far beyond their depth, and all of a sudden it gets burst, and they sink. And I, um, I was so taken with it that I, I was meeting with a bunch of my students. We were all graduate students in international affairs. I said, you got to read this speech. And they, uh, we had a wonderful discussion, and they said, well, this guy Shakespeare, did he have any other good speeches? And I said, a few. Uh, and so we, we met a few more times, and that eventually turned into a short course and then a long course, and then, the, uh, and then it turned into a book. And uh, it, it is a labor of love. It's, the angle is a little bit different uh, than, than most books on Shakespeare, and the reason why is uh, in the first sentence I say, it's all, it's all very well to see Richard II, Goneril, and Iago on the stage. I've had to work with some of those people. And, and we take it from there. Well, as we do, we plunge into Shakespeare, why don't we kind of establish for people, um, you know, how it is that he, he develops such acute insights into humanity and the struggle for power. I mean, what kind of mix of, of just, you know, observation, of course, but travel, professional experiences. I mean, he lived during the time of Elizabeth I and James I. You know, how did how did he get so wise on the, the kind of uh, machinations of humanity and then also the struggle for power? So I think the, the quick bottom line is he was a genius. And, you know, we're just not used to geniuses. But if if you if you write this kind, this kind of stuff and they're still reading your, uh, what it is that you've written well over 400 years later than my book, You're a Genius. But to, to be a little bit more specific, how did he understand the politics of courts? Well, um, first I should stipulate that uh, Shakespeare really was Shakespeare and he wrote Shakespeare. You know, there's been a long, long stream of thought saying, well, maybe he was, you know, one of the aristocrats at the court. That's pretty well demolished in a very good book um, by uh, James Shapiro, who's a professor at Columbia called contested will he he definitely existed we have traces but he was very canny which was smart in those times so that although we have some business correspondence we don't have anything like a diary or letters where he's laying out his real views but um, i think the thing for everybody to remember is first he's very well educated uh he went to what was called a grammar school but you know, uh, given the relative standards of those days, this would be like getting a very good undergraduate degree in classics. He, you know, he read he read the classics. He was clearly a voracious reader. But the other thing is um, theater was relatively new, certainly the kind of theater uh, he was doing. It relied on aristocratic sponsorship. And there were that many uh, theater troops, all things considered, and they had patronage. So his company was first the Lord Chamberlain's men, which meant that they were being sponsored by the Lord Chamberlain, Chamberlain, and then it becomes the King's men. So he's, they're being sponsored by James the first. And he is, um, the, you know, very close to courts. The costumes that they wore were usually secondhand aristocratic clothing. Sometimes you'd have command performances before the King or major aristocrats, one of those very nearly got him into trouble, actually. Um, and so they, they were probably closer to the court and watching it more carefully than, uh, than one might think. And you had to, because these were troubled times. You know, you had Catholics versus Protestants. Uh, you had, a, you know, a very fraught um, succession problem with Elizabeth, who, of course, had no heirs you had just come off uh the wars of the roses so there was that you know the that period of turmoil in uh england's history so people were very very attuned to the politics of their time but i guess i'll go back to the thing i said at the beginning i think you know he's just a genius and he was able to he, you know what his one of his great gifts was he could take lots of raw material and work it into you know, these tremendously creative works. He's not an historian. So, you know, his Richard III is not the real Richard III, as far as we know. Um, you know, his Henry V is not the real Henry V. Uh, you know, th so you got to be careful about all that. But but he used it as raw material and he did it brilliantly. Well, Elliot, you write, if Shakespeare teaches us anything about politics, it's the preeminent, preeminent importance of character 
in all, in all of its complexity. And I want to play on two key words, character, which is looms large, and also complexity, because the point you make is that Shakespeare, probably better than anyone, has been able to, to depict people in kind of the, all their dimensions. I mean, he does not do, you know, cliches or cartoon figures. So talk about the importance of character and also the complexity of, of, of Shakespeare's characters. Well, you know, one of the things I, I say in the introduction to the book is, let's be very clear, there are large elements of politics that Shakespeare is not interested in. He He's not interested in economics, as far as I can tell. Uh, he's not really interested in mass movements. He doesn't talk about religion and politics that much, which is, I think, prudent of him. Uh, but he's interested in personalities, and he is, above all, interested in the working out of character. And that's not that's true not just in the political plays. I think it's true... Um, I think it's true throughout. Part of his genius is that he can make even his villains not only interesting, but to some extent somewhat sympathetic. So, you know, the ultimate bad guy king is Richard III, who commits all kinds of murders, and maybe we can talk a little bit more about them after that. But but the thing that I think is... Um, quite remarkable about the way he portrays Richard is actually in, in the play before Richard III, which is Henry VI, part three, he, he, he gives this incredible soliloquy where you, even if you don't sympathize with the guy, you can cer certainly empathize with him. You know, he's uh, deformed. He, he above all knows that he's, uh, he's not just unloved, he's unlovable. Um, he has this kind of claustrophobic view of his career. He knows women find him deeply unattractive. Um, and you, you get a window into him. And he, he continues that in, in the play Richard III with this incredible device of occasionally sort of stopping the action. He delivers a soliloquy. He's looking right at the audience and he's kind of bringing the audience in. And almost making you a little bit complicit, but you know you find him very compelling. I think it's one of the reasons why it's such a favorite play is everybody gets this little chill up their spine when they find themselves being amused by Richard, you know, in, in some terrible way rooting for him. And I think that's really important. I think it's you know we live in an age where there's some pretty monstrous political characters roaming the earth, and one of the things that Shakespeare teaches you is the importance of getting inside their skin. Well, I want to jump on that concept because as you write, well, let me read a couple of sentences and just play off that. You said, if there's one quality essential for understanding politics, it is empathy. The ability to imagine the other and see the world as they see it, no matter who they are and what they have done. And then you go on to say, empathy is the essential quality for all of those who desire to understand power. And if Shakespeare teaches us nothing else, it is the ability to inhabit the personality of someone utter, utterly alien or even repugnant to us. Talk about just the importance of empathy in, in leadership, in politics, and in Shakespeare. Well, in, in uh, well, let, let's start at the sort of the end of the spectrum. Um, one of my favorite quotations from John Lukash, who was a wonderful historian, uh, primarily of the Second World War, uh, who wrote a wonderful book about. Churchill versus Hitler during the first couple months of the war called the duel. And one of the things he says there, which has always stuck with me, he said he, he actually believes, and I think he's right, that Hitler was highly intelligent, in some ways extremely clever. Um, but he said the essential difference was Churchill could kind of imagine what it was like to be Hitler, but Hitler could never imagine what it was like to be Churchill. And that that gave... Churchill a, a kind of a distinctive advantage. Now, that's when you're dealing with somebody who is truly evil. And I, I believe that actually, you know, it is very important, for example, for us to get inside the skin of Vladimir Putin, um, to see the world as he sees it, not to be sympathetic, not, not to in any way mitigate the things you do against him, but just to understand so, you, so you're not going to be surprised. But even, you know, stepping back, as I said, from that end of the spectrum, I think it's impossible to exercise any kind of leadership if you can't put yourself in the position of the people you're trying to lead. And whenever we've seen politicians who just 
can't connect, even the good ones, uh, even the ones you'd like to like, but they just somehow can't identify with the troubles of and concerns of the people that they're trying to move along, you see that they fail. Now, let's talk about um, the arc of power. And you have three components of it. The first piece is acquiring power. And you say, you know, Shakespeare in Shakespeare's world, power can be inherited, acquired through cunning and skill, and seized through conspiracy or coups. Um, what does Shakespeare tell us at core about acquiring power? So uh, just by, first by way of introduction, the uh, when I decided to write a book about Shakespeare, I, I decided I would not do it the usual way, which is to write about it play by play. I think that's a mistake, uh, or it was a mistake for me. It works perfectly well for other people. Um, and so, the, as you said, the book is about the arc of power, how people acquire it, how they use it, and then eventually how they lose it or walk away from it. So when it comes to acquiring power, there are, I think, a number of things that are important. One of them is that, um, you know, the most regular thing is people sort of inherit power. And sometimes it's, um, you know, parent to child. Uh, sometimes, you know, I, I mentioned the uh, famous flame out at uh, General Electric where Jack Welch, you know, picked an inheritor uh, and, you know, Jeffrey Amelt, and that effectively destroyed GE. So he has a lot to say about um, how how that dynamic works. The the one inheritor that he has who's really quite successful is Henry V, who whose father had effectively stolen the throne. Um, and but you know Henry Henry V, Prince Hal, you know, is clearly the legitimate heir. But I think the the thing that that uh, Shakespeare shows is even if you're inheriting it, you still have to earn it. And so Hal goes through this, I think, quite deliberate self-education where he's hanging around a brothel in East Cheap. Uh, I mean, maybe technically it's a tavern, but I think it's pretty clear that it's a brothel. And he's hanging around with all kinds of low lowlifes. And of course, the most famous of them being Falstaff, who's one of Shakespeare's great comic uh, uh, creations, and he he is learning a lot, um, which he and he needs it, because even if you inherit power, I think one of the things Shakespeare is always saying to us, it's never really completely secure. Now there are other modes of acquiring power, and uh, Shakespeare talks about them. I, you know, I talk about in in the second chapter, uh, Hal's father, who becomes Henry the Fourth, Henry, who's then Henry Bolingbroke. Um, but of course, one of the problems when you acquire power in that way, you never feel entirely secure. And uh, when it's by intrigue and sort of underhandedness and deviousness, and then there's acquiring power by murder. And and there, of course, the the problem that you have, which really comes out in Macbeth, is you you and this this really is Macbeth's problem. He would like this to end with one murder but it doesn't end with one murder. It never ends with one murder. You commit one murder, you're going to have to commit more murders. Now, I, I should, you know, some people might say, well, okay, he's talking about monarchy in a pretty, uh, you know, pretty dark world. That's not how things work. But I, I, I would submit that actually the same basic patterns still hold in, in many, many ways. Um, and, you know, people inherit power, uh, People kind of connive their way into it sometimes, you know, and I've I've seen organizational coups where, you know, in effect, a CEO just got a knife right in the back. Uh, happens to deans, too. Uh, you know, so the, these are not, uh, you know, these are not unknown to us today. Well, I want to read a sentence. You say Shakespeare's view of how self-made men and women get to the top is not a pretty one. Those who are who, who are skillful mix soft manners and measured brutality, concealing what they can and revealing what they must. Yeah, that's a. I think um, one of you know one of my favorite characters is Henry the Fourth, who, who's not a likable person. I don't like the guy, but but that is very much Henry the Fourth, who was first Henry Bolingbroke, 
who is not a particularly lovable figure. He's not a particularly even inspiring figure. He's very smart. And Shakespeare does show us that he, you know, he uses violence um, and he does dark things. But most of the rest of the time, he tries to keep that under control. He's actually one of the few characters who's who's able to control the use of force. Um, and it makes him an unlovable character. And by the way, he's also a guy who can't understand his own son. You know, the the end of Henry the Fourth, Part Two, is this uh, you know, this terrible scene where Hal comes to visit his dad who's dying and his father's sort of asleep, practically in a coma. So Hal takes the crown and begins, oh, this this is pretty nice. And, you know, <laughs> Henry uh, wakes up and basically said, oh, you can't wait till I'm dead. And, you know, and then Hal gives some sort of excuse. And, he's, and, and Henry IV says, uh, the wish Harry was father to the thought. <laughs> so he, he's not a happy character. But but Henry IV is someone who is, I think, in some ways, sort of a Machiavellian prince, you know, who's controlled in that. Most, most of the rest of them find they cannot control it. Yeah. Actually, well, you have you've made a couple of references to Henry V, and I want to read a couple of sentences, which um, which is really uh, pertinent to the the exercise of the power. And you made a reference to it a little bit ago. You said Henry V knows something that many leaders never fully realize: that having received received an officer title, be it king, president, or chief executive officer, the holder must continue to win it day in and day out. The great politicians are always aware that power can slip through their fingers, that they can be toppled in an election or simply by others failing to take them seriously. And then you go on to say, Henry V shows us that the wise or at least a successful leader never rests. Yeah. Well, and, that, and that's how you get, um, again, that famous line, again, from Henry IV, that uh, uneasy lies the head that wears the crown. You know, it's you. You're never. You you know you never entirely rest. I mean, it's, you know, part of the genius of the American system is when you're president and you're in your second term. You know that that's pretty much it. But then you get other pathologies because people immediately begin, you know, trying to figure out who's who's the next one. And so, uh, even then, you know, when you have that kind of certainty, uh, you can't really rest. Well, Elliot, the, the the third part of the arc of power concerns losing power, and I have to say, as I was reading your uh, this chapter, I was uh, you know reading also in the New York Times a chronicle of the final days of of Kevin McCarthy in the House, and you know there was a really vivid depiction of him as anger and angry and bitter and feeling betrayed and not knowing quite what hit him and just just in an awful state. And, and and then as I was reading that in the Times, I came across this, this, uh, this uh, sentence or two from you in which you say, arrogance and innocence often join together to dull a leader's wit and set him up or her up to, for the final surprise. It is a mistake to think that leaders necessarily become more seasoned, more skilled, and wiser as they settle into power. Yeah. Play off that because we do have this kind of little bit of a, a narrative that, you know, as people get more seasoning and they get more experience, they just have, a, you know, they, they have a, a better read of just the environment that they're operating in. I, I think there's a curve, uh, actually, where, you know, when you have a certain amount of experience, then you're, you're really at your peak. Uh, but the problem, as, as Shakespeare shows, is that once you're on top, your ego slips out of control. You have fewer people around you who are really willing to set you straight. It's why uh, frequently marriages are the most important part of keeping a, a leader, um, you know, in some sort of equipoise. I and mean, it's why the relationship between Winston Churchill and Clementine Churchill was so, so famously important because she was quite capable of giving him a dressing down and he could, he could hear it. But but most people can. I mean, I think the great uh, case there, which I talk a bit about, is Julius Caesar, the play that is, where you know Julius Caesar's in 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 the play. On the one hand, Caesar sets himself up for assassination by this kind of over the top egotism that you know I'm as constant as the North Pole. You know, he's talking about himself in the third person, which is usually a good sign that you're a little bit crazy. Um, 
you know, and, uh, you know, fear should be afraid of me. I mean, it, it, he, he really it is kind of losing touch with reality. And the only people he has around him are people like Mark Anthony who are flattering him. And he can't even really hear the soothsayer who comes and you know, kind of tells him what the truth is. But, but the thing is that the leader of the conspiracy to get him, Brutus, is also sort of out of touch with reality, also has to be kind of flattered into doing something, can't really hear discordant advice. And, you know, the, one of the great things about Shakespeare is he works in there, like, there are like these little things there, which it's easy to pass over. But if you sit back and think about it, you go, oh, this is very revealing. So, for example, the conspiracy um, to kill Caesar, as was the case in reality, uh, somebody says, uh, you know, how about if we bring Cicero, the great Roman orator, um, into the plot? And, all, and Bruce, oh, no, 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 no. He, he um, you know, he always wants to be number one. And, you know, you read that and you go, yeah, is there somebody else here who only wants to be, you know, can only be happy if he's number one? Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it is, it is the same thing. And I, you know, from what I've seen of powerful people, I think the further, they, the further along they go, particularly if they've been successful, the less good they are at picking up signals that something's not right, that this isn't going to work, um, that they've made a mistake. And it's, it's harder for them to adjust to all those things. So it's a it's a fairly dark view of where power takes you. Well, in your book, you have a wonderful uh, section on Margaret Thatcher as she's losing power, and you know she had been this dominant force and in 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 the UK for a decade, and just could not believe that the party that she had led out of the wilderness and into power that you know the same people have been flattering her. We're now starting to pull away and talk about someone else as the leader of the conservative party. Yeah, it, you know, it, um, it is the kind of thing that can literally drive you crazy. I mean, and the, the case in point there is King Lear, who has decided he wants to retire. So he's doing it on his own terms, in theory. He, he's ready to retire as king. He's going to divide his kingdom among his daughters. Um but then he's outraged when he doesn't get the deference that you get for being a king. And you, as a former king or retired king, you, you don't. And actually, he really doesn't get it from his daughters who kind of whittle him away. And it literally drives him mad. I mean, he was, probably had some, you know, inclinations in that direction anyway. But, but it, it does, losing that power, losing the deference, losing the trappings, the people kind of escorting you everywhere, losing the kind of awe and the respect. It's very hard. It's why, you know, frequently American presidents do not do well in their post-presidency. You know, L LBJ, uh, uh, President Johnson, you know, only lasted uh, a couple of years. Uh, I've been reading a biography of Theodore Roosevelt, deeply, deeply frustrated in most of his post-presidency, um, even though he was a very large personality. It, it uh, you know, once they've these people have tasted power, they find it hard to let go. Yeah. Well, you have a really fun chapter on magic. And I want to read a couple sentences. And we actually, the last time we talked, you were telling us about your affinity to magic uh, mm -hmm. and it, just your fun with it. But you say Shakespeare has plenty to say about magic and politics. His plays are full of magic. And then you're going to say, Shakespeare takes magic seriously, and so should we. Talk about magic and power. Well, um, okay, so uh, benefit of those listening. The, the truth is uh, I'm an amateur magician, not a very good amateur magician, I should add, but, but I do love magic. And there is a lot of magic in Shakespeare. Uh, and it has a real effect. Belief in magic has a real effect on people's behavior. Now, as far as I can tell, what's the case is, it's never actually real magic that's going on. It's people's belief in magic. So, uh, you know, one example is Joan of Arc in Henry VI, who, you know, when you look at it very closely, she has all these successes fighting the, the English until the very end. They have nothing to do with magic, although she's saying that she has magical powers and she's accused of being a witch. And at the end, at the end, she, uh, when she's, about to be burned at the stake, you know, she's 
given into this belief in her own magic and she summons up these spirits and they kind of walk or they show up and walk around the stage and disappear you know and she's stuck or macbeth very famously in the three weird sisters who sort of lure him into killing his patron uh, king duncan and taking the throne if you look at it they don't do anything magical they don't like wave magic wands and have stuff happen they um you know they speak cryptically in ways that lure macbeth into what first into committing crime and then into what what is his own doom and then from my point of view the favorite part is uh at the very end of uh, tempest the great magician prospero decides to relinquish the magic of power because he realizes he can't actually be a human being with that now well, how does that bear on on politics i think a lot of politicians think they have the magic you know it's obama saying i've got the gift um and the, you know, frankly i think you know, that was an administration which in the long run i think we can see did quite poorly and set us up for a, a very very turbulent time afterwards because of a belief in the magic of a single individual which is always i think a it's a dangerous thing i mean it, it it ends up destroying any sense of humility um you know i i never used to understand the idea of a, of a humble leader and i've seen precious few of them but i think to be a, a great leader actually you need an element of hum humility i mean that's why somebody like abraham lincoln is just on a different plane uh than anybody else because there was an essential humility about the man most people don't have that and most people when they're powerful don't have it they they fall in love with their own magic um and then you know one other dimension of this and this does reflect my own experience uh, particularly walking in and out of the white house uh particularly during the bush administration the second term of the bush administration in particular there's an aura about place that it has an effect on people. I mean, you go into the Oval Office, you're going, oh my God, I'm in the Oval Office. And, uh, you know, and I've, I've spoke to uh, President Bush's chief of staff, um, Josh Bolton, and he, he said, yeah, he said it has a real effect on people. He said, I've, I've had people sit in this office, his, his, the chief of staff's office. He said, and they said, I'm going to tell the president this, that, and the other thing. And they go in there and they kind of fall apart. And he said, it's not that, that the president's not willing to hear it. It's just that they're kind of overcome by the aura of magic of, uh, of the white house. And so, yeah, so magic, magic is real. It's, but it's not completely real. Well, wait, I thought one of the most powerful parts of your book is just, um, Shakespeare's perspective on just how power fits into the human life. And I want to read a couple sentences and just have you reflect on them. You say, in a variety of subtle ways, his plays reveal just how much damage power does to all human relationships and to the souls of those who wield it, particularly those who wield it without constraint. And then you go on to say, in the end, Shakespeare is so powerfully compelling about power because he knows it is not the most important thing about our lives and characters. He can describe power with insight and empathy precisely because he understands that it is not what makes us human. He teaches us that power is necessary and unavoidable, but it also comes with a price. He teaches us most importantly that the wisest wielder of it will, with or without regrets, set aside the bargain of power at the expense of his or her soul and happy or not walk away free yeah. talk about shakespeare's well shakespeare and power and and how it affects the human psyche so um let me start with the person who well okay first of all let me start with somebody uh people who are destroyed by power in shakespeare one of them is richard the second uh, who is killed by Henry Bolingbroke, who becomes Henry the Fourth? Who, um, you know, he he he's brilliant. By the way, he's extremely verbal, um, but he uh, and he's clever, but but he's intoxicated with his own power. He has no idea of really how to wield it. And then, famously, when 
he is overthrown, he, he literally doesn't know who he is. You know, his 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 conception of self has has simply fallen apart, and uh, that's actually where the you know, the title of the book comes, where he has this wonderful soliloquy, where he says, "For within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of a king, keeps death his court." And there the antic sits, scoffing his state and grinning at his pomp, allowing him a breath a little seen to monarch eyes be feared and kill with looks, infusing him with self and vain conceit, as if this flesh which walls about our life were brass impregnable, and humored thus, comes at the last and with a little pin, bores through his castle wall, and farewell, king. So it, like a lot of Shakespearean characters, he becomes wise too late. Um... There's a, you know, in the case of somebody who's really bad, uh, like Richard III, what I think you see is something a little bit different, which is um, power makes you worse. And for me, and I mentioned this a little bit in the book because it helped make me realize why Vladimir Putin might really go over the edge in uh, 2022. Um, as In the lead up to the invasion of Ukraine, I was rereading that play for, I don't know, the eighth or ninth time. And... What struck me is in the first three acts of the play, Richard III is, you know, he's maneuvering, he's manipulative, he, but he's and he's doing terrible things. I mean, he's killing his brother and stuff, but he's subtle, he covers his tracks. Um, by the time he gets to act four, where he commits the really, the big famous crime, which is the murder of his nephews in the tower, he's just openly brutal. He says, turns to his lieutenant and says, I wish the bastard's dead and want it done suddenly. Do you understand me? He he is um, he wants to talk to the murderers to see how it was done, the killing children. He you know he talks openly of in effect rape, and you know part of what's happened is that the exercise of a particularly brutal form of power has really completely dehumanized him. Now again, uh, Shakespeare being Shakespeare, he comes to something of a realization of this in his dream before the final battle. In which he's killed, but but he can't really live with himself at um, at that point. So you know, there you have what what how power destroys people. The, for me, the wonderful case, though, is Prospero in uh, Tempest because Prospero decides to walk away from power. Now, and you can tell from the very beginning that he understands there's a problem with being powerful because he's you know he's been cast away on this desert island. Uh, he was supplanted by his brother. He's always been a magician, uh, but he, you know, he was given himself up to these arcane studies and didn't pay attention to his uh, to his dukedom. And he, the time has come where he's going to explain to his daughter how they got there, and it's a wonderful moment where he says, "Help me take off my magic robes." So he understands. Again, it's one of those little moments, but if you look at it closely, what does that mean? What it means is. For him to be able to speak as a father speaks to a daughter, he has to take off the, the robes of power. And actually, he needs her help to get them off. He can't just take them off. She has to help. And then at the end of the play, where, you know, he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be going back to Milan and, uh, you know, every third thought will be of death. I mean, he he's, knows that you know he's he's played his big act, but but one of the things he says that he I will break my staff uh, uh, and bury it several fathoms deep, and uh, deeper than did plummet ever sound. I'll drown my book, his book of magic spells. And again, you have to say, well, okay, why? I mean, you know, during time, he can do amazing things. He can call up storms. He's got spirits. Why does he have to give that up? And again, I think the answer that becomes very clear is this is part of of his recovering a certain kind of humanity. So even, for example, his uh, very brutal, lecherous, dangerous slave, Caliban, who, who he's quite brutal towards in the beginning of the play, he, he says, yeah, this guy, this, this guy's mine. I'm responsible for him. Uh, he, you know, frees his spirit, Ariel, and it, he, it's not that he's happy, but he's now a human figure that we can, um, 
we can engage with. And you have a, a feeling that he's sort of returned to to something that's um, well, as I said, a, a lot more human. I think I think Shakespeare saw enough of power not absolutely not to be in love with it and not to be in love with what it does to people. Well, the, the, to to finish the story that you're you're you're, you're telling a bit is that you know in, in the the weeks before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, you had gone to this Munich security conference, and everyone, I mean, the prevailing thought seemed to be that you know Putin's bluffing, and you know he maybe will take a little sliver of Ukraine and then pull back. But as you're telling the book that you had just finished uh, reading uh, Richard for the seventh or eighth time, and you're thinking, hang on a second, maybe maybe. The constraints that we thought were there are no are no longer in place. Yeah, yeah, and he, he's and maybe he's psychologically not in the same place. The other thing that I that for me was sort of a tip off, and it does does echo Richard the um, Third. If you remember, he he says at one point, in effect, to the Ukrainians, um, "Like it or not, my lovely, you'll have to put up with it." it was a pretty clear reference to rape, and. That's also part of Richard the Third. I mean, there's a there's a kind of a deep misogyny and uh, you know that kind of brutal assertion of a certain kind of masculine power, and um, that too I thought was a kind of a, a a warning sign that a guy who'd been you know clever and indirect and subtle, brutal, but you know covered his tracks. Maybe this time, no. Maybe this time he's kind of slipped the bonds and now he's in a different place and he'll do anything. And I, you know, as I, unfortunately, as you know, um, I think events have borne out that, that assessment and, and it means that he will continue to slip from any kind of restraints. We shouldn't, we're dealing, you know, by the end of the play, Richard is half mad and it's a, a scary thing, but we're not dealing with a rational calculator anymore. We're dealing with somebody who is half mad. And that's a that's a terrifying thing to to think about, but unfortunately, we have to. Well, Elliot, for our, our viewers who are now persuaded that they should be reading Shakespeare, um, you know, for students, we have a terrific Shakespeare class at the university, which I my wife took and is just a huge uh, proponent of. But for those you know people who are say mid career or maybe even retirees, who's like, well, gosh, I've always wanted to read Shakespeare. He's always seemed so formidable. The language. You know, can be a bit of a struggle. I mean, how should for how should someone start? What is the point? The best point of entry into um, Shakespeare after they read your book, of course. Uh, well, yes, of course. Um, you know, I I think some of the plays are more straightforward than others in engaging you. Uh, I think Julius Caesar. You know, I always think of Julius Caesar. It's like the movie Casablanca. There's not an extra word in it. Um, it's very accessible and very powerful. I think Henry V is certainly is the same way, and then and Macbeth, which is dark, but and then you know, as, in terms of actually reading it, I think get, given to the music of the language, you know, I I mentioned the book. There's a um, there was a wonderful book by a woman who taught Shakespeare to uh, prisoners in a supermax prison. And it was a fascinating book. And, you know, one of the things I, I was listening to an interview with her saying, well, the, the interviewer was saying, well, you know, they couldn't, I mean, you're describing people who in many cases have very limited educations and have other sort of disabilities. She said, they're used to not understanding most of the words around them, but they get the music of it and they get the basic human dynamics of it. So I would I would do that. There are, you know, there are wonderful film versions of the three plays that I um, I mentioned, but I I think you can really savor Shakespeare best by reading. You know, there's always been a dispute: is it better seen on stage or is it better read? Lincoln, by the way, thought it was much better read than seen on stage, although he saw plenty of it on stage. So there's that. And then the one other thing which I would just mention because I think it it help should help people appreciate why it might speak to them. You know, a lot of Shakespeare's, uh, particularly the the plays about um, the uh, uh, the English monarchy, are about courts and court politics. And you know, I'll just say, you know, I've served in the uh, near the top of the State Department. I've been a dean. Uh, I've hung around enough with chief executive officers. C court politics is universal. 
I mean, it's it it's there everywhere. You know, there's a king or a queen and a crown prince and, uh, you know, some unhappy dukes. Uh, there's probably a court jester or two floating around. Uh, you know, there are bodyguards who might, you know, sometimes protect the king and sometimes kill him. Um, and, you know, just if you think about it that way, you, you realize there's actually a lot of parallels to to our lives. Um, but the main thing I would just say is I pick some of those plays, which are, I think, the ones that are most accessible. And, you know, then just let yourself go and have fun with it. And don't be afraid of this. Uh, but people tend not to want to do this. Don't be afraid to read some of the great speeches out loud because they will make much more sense when you read them out loud. You realize, you know, part of the genius of Shakespeare is just the way he used the English language. And if you speak some of the uh, speeches to yourself or to a long-suffering spouse uh, or, or partner, you, you, you know, you'll it'll make a lot more sense to you. Um, and but of course, then you won't be able to stop. Well, and as you point out in your book, people as diverse as Lincoln, Churchill, John F. Kennedy, some of their kind of classic speeches have resonance or, oh, or yeah. their echoes of Shakespeare. I mean, clearly they are their speech writers. Lincoln didn't really have a speech writer, of course, and Churchill. And but I mean, you know, they Churchill uh, shaped their some of the great speeches in world history. Oh, absolutely. John F. Kennedy's uh, first inaugural, or only inaugural. Um, I think they're, they're definitely echoes of uh, Shakespeare. You know, some of the, some of the rhetorical uh, forms, um, you know, various kinds of inversions, uh, technically known as chiasmus, or sort of repeating certain phrases, we'll fight on the beaches, we'll fight on the landing grounds, we'll fight in the hills and in the streets. Those are pretty standard rhetorical devices. Shakespeare uses all of them to make the speeches um, to make the speeches punchier, and I, I go through a number of the great speeches by Churchill, by uh, Zelensky, by Kennedy, and show that there are um, a lot of the same devices are being used, and in some cases, you know, I think quite quite self consciously. By the way, you know, I mean, Churchill was a, a tremendous Shakespearean fan. There's a great story in there that I quote. Where Richard Burton, the great actor, after, shortly after World War II, is he's playing Hamlet, and he's told that uh, the old man is going to be in the audience. The old man, of course, meant Churchill, and he gets up and he's delivering some of the famous speeches, and he hears this rumble and he realizes that Churchill is reciting the speech at the same time, and he tries to speed up and he can't shake him off. He tries to slow down, he can't shake him off. He's a complete nervous wreck. You know the the intermission. He goes to um, the uh, to the green room. Uh, and there's a knock on the door. There's Churchill. Says, "My Lord Hamlet, may I use your washroom?" <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, Elaine, I want to pick your mind on another topic or two, if I could, because you you continue to write astonishingly important and interesting essays in the Atlantic. And you've made a couple of references to Ukraine. And I, I was going back at some of the pieces you've written. And this was maybe two weeks or three weeks after the invasion, uh, the Russian invasion. And, and you, you wrote this. You said, for those of us born after World War II, this is the most consequential war of our lifetime. Upon its outcome rests the future of European stability and prosperity. Um where are we now? I mean, we read, you know, long accounts of, a, uh, you know, a, a Ukrainian counteroffensive that seemed to to stalemate. Um, so, I mean, where are we now in terms of the battle? And, and how do you read this sort of uh, turmoil within the United States, particularly within the Republican Party, in which people are, are wondering if we should continue to uh, support Ukraine as fully as we have up to now? Well, I don't know if you have a couple more hours. Um, you know, I, I'll stand by what I wrote, but I think in some ways it's even more than that because I, I uh, the, by the end of this year, I will have been to Ukraine, uh, Israel, and uh, I've been to Taiwan as well, which is not a hot war, but there's the potential. In three cases, you've got uh, liberal democracies under really quite ferocious assault. Uh, while we're not paralyzed, but certainly divided at home. I, you know, I used to be a Republican. Um, I mean, now I'm just a homeless person. 
Um, I think if you know people who don't support aid to Ukraine don't understand the stakes. They really don't. And of course, they don't understand the bargain. You know, for like a few percentage points of the defense budget, we are demolishing the Russian army. And you know, what a bargain is that? Not a drop of American blood being spilled. Um, you know, the the war is going to go on for another year or two. Unfortunately, um, I think it is important to realize there are some ways in which the Ukrainians have been actually quite successful. You know, particularly in the Black Sea, where they've really, in effect, been able to drive. The Russian Navy out of Sevastopol, sort of it's a naval victory for a country that no longer has a, a navy. But uh, along the main front, you know, we we didn't give them enough of what they needed, uh, and we didn't give what we did give them fast enough. And I think we we have a, bear a lot of responsibility. We also, I think, encourage them to attack in ways that might have made sense for us, although I'm not even sure about that. But couldn't possibly have made sense for them, given um, you know the the kind of equipment they had, the amount of equipment, and the amount of the amount of training. Um, you know, this is a, a war of endurance, like many such wars. Um, we don't. The one thing I, I would caution everybody is I don't think we see the strain on the other side as much. Uh, you know, Russia is an extremely controlled environment, and if anything, it's become more so. And so I, you know, I actually suspect that there's a lot going on underneath the surface there. The the, the tell in all that was, uh, you know, the incredible Prigozhin affair, where you know this guy who's clearly half out of his mind begins marching on Moscow, and he's greeted with flowers, and and nobody tries to stop him really. Uh, now that ended it ended with Prigozhin's death, predictably, but but it does tell you that there are things that are going on underneath the surface there, but we are, look, you know, my, my basic view is, and I'm going to be writing more about this is it, we're, we're in a period that's not unlike the thirties. And, you know, in the 1930s, you might've said, well, in 1935, yes, there's the Italian invasion of Ethiopia. That's a pity, but it's kind of far away. Uh, yes, there's the German occupation of the Rhineland in 1936, but that's, you know, the Rhineland status was ambiguous. And in 1937, you had the Marco Polo Bridge incident in China. And again, you know, you might have said, well, that's that's really deep in the heart of Asia. Well, you know, do we really want to get involved? But the problem is that the three of them together put together a picture. And it was a very scary picture uh, and a picture that people didn't want to look at. And I'm afraid that we're looking at a picture that's pretty scary. Well, Elliot, I know actually you're leaving this evening to go to Israel and you, um, you've you been writing about that powerfully. I want to read a couple sentences and have you reflect on it. You say, um, too much of the commentary on the war in Gaza begins with tactics, which are concerned with achieving small concrete military object objectives, such as taking a hill and launching an ambush. It is with strategy that an understanding of this conflict should begin. What strategy should Israel be embracing right now, in your view? Well, I think, uh, I mean, you know, I'm going to be curious to find out. So I'm, I'm going with an open mind. I don't think they have an alternative other than to destroy Hamas. I mean, the, you know, the magnitude of this horror, you, to, to really get at it, you have to do the arithmetic so that, you know, the equivalent of the United States would be losing not 2,000 people in one day as we did at 9-11, but 40,000 people with, you know, rape, and all, all that, all the all the horrors um, uh, and not, you know, hundreds of hostages, but thousands of hostages. And they have no choice. But I think the big the big issue for them is that for the first time in really half a century, the existential question is on the table. And I think that they have to think about it that way, but without simply losing their heads. That's, I think, the real challenge. Because uh, the reality is existential. I mean, the purpose of what Hamas, what Hamas and Hezbollah and Iran want to do is they want to wipe Israel off the face of the map and kill lots of Jews. I mean, that's that it's that simple. That doesn't mean that uh, you know you you simply resort to massive violence, although massive violence is to some extent what's called for. And I think the the issue, the key issue, 
you know, which again, I'll be curious to find out about is, okay, how do you think about Gaza the day after? But I think we're in for a couple more, certainly a few more weeks, possibly even a couple more months of quite brutal urban fighting, which is going to kill a lot of civilians. Um, I've been reminding, um, I was just in Australia, I reminded audiences there that when we liberated Manila in February of 1945, and within a few weeks, uh, we killed 100,000 civilians just liberating a friendly city. I mean, it's this is the most brutal form of warfare uh, there is, urban warfare. And even if the Israelis take measures, as I think to some extent they are, a lot of civilians are going to get hurt. And that's also because of deliberate strategy on the part of Hamas. So um, I think that's really, it, the you know, the this is, you know, the initial reaction still to uh, the events of October 7th, um, but there'll be a third stage and a fourth stage and a fifth stage. And the question is, uh, have, how deeply they've thought about, about that. Elliot, final question I want to ask you. You wrote a terrific essay in Foreign Affairs about a year ago, I think it was, on the importance of statecraft. And I want to read a couple sentences and, and have you kind of reflect on it. And of course, there's always been a dis discussion about, you know, do we need another big concept to replace containment? You know, what sort of strategic framework do we need to put in place? And you say, after decades of relying on big strategic ideas that are translated into policy by complex and arduous bureaucratic processes, the United States government was returned to statecraft. This means an approach that embodies a fine-grained comprehension excuse me, Henshin, of the world, the ability to quickly detect and respond to challenges, a penchant for exploiting opportunities as they arise, and behind all of this, effective institutions for the formulation and conduct of a nimble foreign policy. Um, is there anyone in the world who's doing statecraft well? I mean, what can the United States do to make our statecraft um, rise to the moment we're in? I think it depends on the people you put into office. Um, I that's that at the end of the day is what matters ab above all else. Um, it's also a mindset. Um, I'll bring us back to Shakespeare a little bit. Uh, you know, it's part of the mindset of statecraft. Is uh, actually a great line by Henry the Fourth, who at a particularly difficult moment says, "If these are necessities, let us meet them like necessities." You know, part of part of what statecraft is about is seeing, okay, this is the thing I have to do now. Let's go out and do it, um, and do it as effectively as possible. Rather, you know, there are times for extended debate and uh, reflection and revisiting decisions, and I've I've seen plenty of that. And then there are times when you say, no, actually, we have to do something fast now. And the, to its credit, the Biden administration has done some of those things. But I think it's been very, very uneven. And it, um, you know, the initial reaction to Ukraine was, I thought, you know, showed statesmanship. You know, what followed was too little, too little, too late. Um, I think, you know, the initial reaction on Israel was good. But, you know, what what follows after that, I, I don't know. But at the end of the day, you know, and, and again, it's also a Shakespearean point. It comes down to individuals. You know, what Shakespeare is about is the talents, the capabilities, um, the moral strengths of individual leaders. And you know, too much of the social sciences would have us believe that individual leaders don't make a difference. And I think what Shakespeare shows us is they absolutely do. Elliot, thank you for such a terrific conversation. And again, the hollow crown, everyone who's looking for a, a Hanukkah gift or a Christmas gift or, or just uh, reading for the holidays, this is a terrific book. Um, I'm sure for people who are expert in Shakespeare and for others who are just trying to get entry into Shakespeare, this is certainly one of the great places to start. So Elliot, safe travels. Let's keep in touch. And we will get you to Southern Illinois. And I want to see some of these, these magic tricks. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. This was a great conversation. I appreciate it. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for watching another edition of our series. We will have this video on our website in the coming days. Please show it to family and friends. Thanks for keeping the memory of Paul Simon alive and well. Thanks so much.